Ready to go. So I would like to welcome you to today's webinar provided by the Statistics Division. My name is Stephen Schulke. I am the past chair of the Statistics Division. Uh, our webinar will be recorded and will be available within about a week on the Statistics Division YouTube channel. Uh, and also, if you're a member of ASQ, uh, go to our My ASQ page and you can see some of our past webinars and our future webinar. Uh, we have one scheduled in early November on chi-square testing. Uh, so with that, I'm going to introduce Dr. Stephen Bailey. Uh, Steve received his BS, MS, and PhD in statistics, all from the University of Wisconsin, with his thesis done under the supervision of Dr. George Fox. He completed a 36-year DuPont career in 2016 with their Corporate Applied Statistics Group, retiring as their Principal Consultant and Master Black Belt. Steve has been an ASQ member for 35 years, sorry, leader for 35 years, most notably as a president in 1997 through 98 and the chairman of the board in 98 through 99. Steve is an ASQ Fellow and recipient of ASQ's Distinguished Service Medal. Steve is a certified black belt and a master black belt by both DuPont and ASQ. And with that, I'm going to let Steve have at it. Uh, all attendees except myself and Steve have been muted. If you have questions, please submit them in the chat box. And when Steve is done, I'll be able to share those with Steve for hopefully a, an intelligent and delightful answer. So with that, Dr. Bailey, have at thank, it. Thank you, Steve. Um, my talk today is George Box, DuPont and Successful Experimentation. And let me begin with uh, George. Uh, this Friday, would have been George's 100th birthday. Uh, George passed away in uh, 2013. Uh, they're actually gonna have a celebration this Friday in Madison, Wisconsin at the University of Wisconsin to uh, commemorate his life. And uh, unfortunately, uh, I am unable to make that due to a couple of other commitments, but that made me think this might be a good time to reflect a little bit on what George has contributed and also um, how it relates to uh, the DuPont part of my talk. And then I'll ultimately get to um, four short case studies of successful experimentation. There's many places to look uh, at uh, the contributions uh, George uh, gave. Uh, and uh, one in particular I like, which came out uh, right after he passed in 2013 was in this special issue uh, that uh, a number of folks, most of whom are actually students of uh, George Box, uh, wrote various uh, aspects of his life, talking about what he did in uh, design of experiments, in time series, in Bayesian inference, in process control, and so forth. Uh, so that's a good place to look. I've uh, highlighted uh, two names in red here, uh, Dave Bacon and Conrad Fung. They, along with myself and a couple of others, uh, are both uh, ex-Box uh, students and ex-Duponters. So uh, I'll mention those as we go along. Actually, uh, Conrad is uh, on the uh, next chart. Uh, I don't expect you to read this chart, but uh, I was looking for a picture uh, that uh, George and myself and maybe some others, and about the best I could come up with, interestingly enough, was uh, right when I joined DuPont in the early 80s, uh, we actually uh, had George come out and we gave uh, DuPont, uh, taped him uh, in the industrial uh, statistician series that ASA uh, put together. And we also had Stu Hunter and Bill Hunter there, Box Hunter and Hunter, uh, a seminal uh, textbook on experimental design. In the background there in the top left uh, picture is Conrad Fung and then myself there. At the bottom picture has George and my uh, first supervisor, DuPont, Ron Snee. So, uh, just thinking a little bit uh, back uh, at uh, uh, my transition from uh, the 70s in Wisconsin to uh, uh, DuPont uh, in the uh, early 80s. 
Uh, about the best picture I have of uh, George uh, is one, this is uh, like two decades ago, uh, that he's uh, having a nice little dance with my wife, Mark. And this is uh, right after George was named uh, ASQ's 21st uh, honorary member. So that uh, was kind of a nice little touch. Uh, so how does George and uh, DuPont relate? Uh, the uh, um, a particular uh, article in Chemical Engineering News uh, was entitled uh, back in 2013, Design of Experiments Makes a Comeback. I don't think it ever had to make a comeback in uh, DuPont. It was kind of like a very uh, uh, highly used uh, tool in, uh, and strategy uh, in DuPont. But uh, I did uh, kind of uh, chuckle a little bit uh, from this article. It said kind of simplified uh, the design experiment world as four milestones. And the first was Ron uh, Ronald A. Fisher, of course, is agricultural experiments. The second, of course, is George Box. And then the third, they um, um, uh, mentioned uh, DuPont, uh, where we you know, would train our internal employees on the design of experiments and, in fact, uh, offered that training to other companies way back in the 70s, well before many other uh, DOE courses were out there. Uh, the last thing they mentioned in the article is the, the uh, Food and Drug Administration Quality by Design uh, initiative. So, uh, any event, so there's George and DuPont somewhat <laughs> kind of linked. And actually, George was uh, involved early on in the development of our Strategy of Experimentation, or SOE course, which actually was born in 1964, as you can see in uh, red on this uh, chart. This chart really uh, is a uh, poster that I put together uh, in DuPont on the 50th anniversary of, of uh, strategy experimentation. That was 2014 um, and includes a little bit of a pledge of allegiance to the article. Uh, so in any event, uh, uh, it's a long history of you know, how the DOE theory in one column uh, over the decades was developed, what areas it was applied to, the various courses we had and the audience for those courses. And I'll just make a side comment in the middle. We talked about uh, software that went from handheld held calculators to Univax to uh, some of the early uh, um, statistical software packages that address design of experiments uh, to today. Um, the uh, examples you're going to see in the uh, uh, presentation are going to be done with Minitab, but of course they can also be done with Jump or uh, Design Expert or uh, many other uh, uh, software packages as well. Just make that point here. So in DuPont, the strategy of experimentation basically um, it was a strategy, and uh, it recognized the evolution of experiment, the experimental environment, going from screening out many possible factors that are important to characterizing the, the effects of a smaller number to an ultimate optimization uh, across those factors to uh, get good products and processes. Um, in the middle of this chart is the basic uh, building block for uh, these good designs, two-level factorial designs, fully um, uh, full factorial designs in the middle there. Uh, the screening on the left would be when you can't, uh, for whatever reason, run all of the possible combinations of uh, the factors at two levels each. And of course, I can only picture three here, and I would hope if you had only three uh, factors, you'd actually run uh, the experiment in the middle with all eight corners rather than just those four. But uh, the idea is if you had to run just four experiments, those would be the four to run on the left or the uh, reverse four, um, the other four that are not shown, uh, because they have uh, good balance and orthogonality uh, properties, which we'll talk about shortly. So in any event, uh, this uh, very powerful strategy experimentation uh, used in, uh, in uh, DuPont. Um, so with that, let me just talk about the outline for the rest of the webinar. I did talk a bit about George and his 100th birthday and his contributions, talked a bit about our uh, DuPont's uh, strategy experimentation history now up to 55 years in, in 2019. I mean, even as I speak, I know one of my uh, other colleagues, Kim Hockman, is delivering a strategy experimentation course in DuPont. So it uh, continues there. Uh, any event, uh, the rest of this uh, presentation uh, will uh, uh, have two sections. One is a little bit on screening experiments. I'll give uh, a little bit of background and then two examples. And I will follow that with some optimization experiments, a little bit of background and two more examples. Uh, the screening examples will use what I'll call classical designs. They're catalog. They're out there. Uh, uh, George, uh, pretty... Uh, uh, famously uh, documented their uh, properties with uh, uh, Stu Hunter and so forth, and um, we'll uh, talk about those. Optimization, of course, uh, George and his uh, 
um, uh, colleagues uh, develop response surface methodology, uh, another set of catalog designs, but we'll talk about the use of custom designs to um, um, apply to a couple of examples. So let's start with the screening piece, two level screening experiments. Uh, in green, they're successful because they are balanced and they're orthogonal, and what that means uh, I'll show in the first example, but basically for two level designs, this means uh, the number of experimental runs is a multiple of four, and uh, they get run. These experiments actually get done, which makes it uh, very valuable. So what are the technical questions? Or just a couple, really. Uh, how many experimental runs should we uh, include in our designed experiment? And what is the effect of ignored second order effects? Uh, these screening designs are trying to look at the main effects to identify the critical few X's or, or inputs from the uh, many that you're studying in the experiment. Uh, but there are second order effects that uh, you know may uh, cause us uh, some consternation. Uh, two factor interactions, where are they in these screening designs? And curvature, how is that addressed or not addressed? Those are second order effects that uh, is the other technical question. So as I go through the two examples, the first one will be uh, one of a plaque of Berman design, it'll be a 20 run design. And the second one will be a two to the K minus P uh, fractional factorial design, eight factors K, uh, one, um, uh, eight, eight, a sixteenth fraction of that, so two to the eight minus four specifically. Uh, we'll see uh, what the, uh, the benefits are of these and how to um, uh, resolve the technical questions. The first technical question, however, the idea of how many experiments should we actually run uh, is uh, fairly straightforward. And uh, another colleague of DuPont, uh, uh, Bob Wheeler, who literally left DuPont uh, at his 15 year mark to go and uh, create uh, a software package called eChip for experimental design, uh, which was out there for a long period of time. Uh, 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 Bob's passed away, uh, but uh, was one of the early uh, adopters of uh, using uh, uh, software to uh, execute uh, experimental design. He had a uh, what's called a portable power rule of thumb, and uh, this is the rule of thumb that says uh, if you want to pick up a, a delta-sized effect and you're trying to fight through uh, with a, a sigma-sized noise, the signal-to-noise ratio, delta divided by sigma, uh, you can... Uh, uh, have a right-sized experiment to pick up a two standard deviation size effect in as little as 12 to 16 experiments. You're going to need 49 to 64 experiments for a one standard deviation size effect. So that's the, the sweet spot. I don't think anyone uh, goes all the way to half a standard deviation uh, goal. If they do, they need uh, uh, several hundred experiments to achieve that. In any event, it's a good uh, rule. It's uh, independent of how many factors you have, K. It's uh, the seven or eight in the numerator is just a good balance of what the underlying alphas and betas might be for this type of sample size calculation. But it's a quick rule of thumb to remember. So let's talk about the second technical question, that one of where do the second order effects go? And let's talk about the interactions in particular and bring up the con uh, concept of resolution. What is the resolution of a design? And uh, the easiest way to describe this is with the grouped finger rule. <laughs> so if I throw up three fingers for a resolution three design, I'll take one finger and I say that's a main effect. It's confounded with the other two fingers, uh, a second way, a two way interaction. OK, so the effect of factor A uh, is going to be confounded in some way with the interaction of factors B and C, for example. Uh, so that's resolution three. We can get a little bit uh, more resolution if we go to resolution four. Main effects in that case are just confounded with three-way interactions, so we get a clear view of um, the effect, uh, the main effects uh, in this type of design. And the two-way interactions are confounded with each other uh, and put off to the side, so they're not affecting the main effects. That's good. Uh, and then ultimately, if we go to resolution five, uh, we've got uh, 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 main effects are confounded with four-way interactions, uh, so main effects come out really clear. Uh, two-way interaction are confounded with three-way interactions, so we tend to uh, treat them as the two-way interactions, and we can get a full um, uh, second-order model uh, of main effects and interaction with that. So, um, in uh, Minitab, they kind of use uh, everyone likes stoplight charts: red, yellow, and green. And the, uh, so uh, these uh, resolution three is uh, red, uh, and yellow is four, and uh, green is five or above. Uh, I like to uh, 
make a little bit more detail of uh, that chart. And I, I'm going to borrow Tom Ridge's old uh, uh, Homeland Security system. Uh, I am not, uh, you know, trying to equate to, in any way uh, our Homeland Security uh, with uh, the choosing of an experimental design. I'm just borrowing his colors. Uh, but for the Resolution 3 designs, there is a benefit for Plackett Berman designs uh, a little bit over the uh, two level, uh, two to the K minus P fractional factorial designs. So that's why I've got orange rather than uh, red there. And uh, for resolution four, um, which you can actually get by folding over the resolution three designs, um, that's where you you know just uh, run the second uh, set of experiments where instead of um, the low, it's a high, and the high, it's a low for each of the experimental runs. Uh, you can get that. And of course, resolution five down there in green is uh, the best. So as you go down, it's going to cost more experiments, but you get more resolution. So you try and pick a particular uh, place to go. Uh, one example I won't talk about because I don't have the data, uh, but it relates to the example I'm going to start talking about in the next chart is within DuPont, uh, we had in particular a real marketing DOE with many factors. Actually, there's 22 of them that are shown on this chart. Uh, the uh, experiment was done with the 24-run Plackett-Berman design, and I'll show you a 20-run Plackett-Berman example here in a minute, but the 24 runs, actually, uh, we went ahead and folded that over, which means if uh, the first experiment was run at the low, low, high, 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 et cetera, uh, another experiment in the folder was high, high, low, 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 was the folded over idea here. So they actually ran this experiment uh, over 40 experimental runs of 48 different customers and uh, the um, um, in a certain region for a certain business. Of the 22 experimental factors that they were going to look at, a couple of them kind of um, fell out. So you, if you look on the uh, x-axis, there was a dummy one and dummy two. They didn't quite go. But we looked at 20 factors, and uh, at the end of the day, this single chart, which shows uh, uh, three uh, at the left that really were beneficial uh, to uh, increasing sales, and one over to the right that was really not beneficial. In fact, it uh, um, hurt uh, the sales. It says telemarketing. I wonder if they were calling it dinner. <laughs> uh, any event, uh, the uh, you know the uh, AB, the ability of trying to see these 20 uh, factors and what are the most important ones. There's a very powerful uh, experiment that led to uh, improved sales in the uh, region of Dupont. So one uh, more published example, and it's my first of the four examples I promised you, is uh, the one that is published and we'll talk in some detail about. And it comes from the uh, book. Um, testing one, two, three, experimental design with applications and marketing and service operations. Uh, a couple of authors there. And Hannes Ladolter is, in fact, uh, an ex-George uh, Box student. And uh, his uh, example here, he lists 19 different factors from the envelope teaser for factor A, return address for factor B, all the way down to uh, the interest rate uh, for factor S. These are 19 factors associated with mailing out something. And they got two different levels of uh, each of those factors. The experimental run, uh, runs that were run is a 20 run plaque of Berman design. So the two levels are noted by a minus and a plus uh, for each of these uh, 19 factors. And those are the 20 runs. Uh, and, and the response was a percent positive response to uh, the mailer. So they actually took each of these 20 combinations and mailed uh, each to 500 customers, or 5,000 I should say, so do the math, this was a 100,000 um, uh, piece mail out, 5,000 each going to each of the 20 combinations here. And you can see on the right of the chart what the uh, results were in terms of response rate, uh, anywhere from less than 1% to um, uh, close to 3% response. Just anything that improves response even a little bit is gonna be uh, very beneficial uh, in this marketing application. When you take these 20 experimental uh, data points and try to sort out the 19 factors, you've got the 19 factors and their factor effects here, and then of course the overall constant term, the average of all the response rate. You have used your entire data set up to uh, understand the factors. So uh, a couple of technical questions uh, occur here. One is, well, which of these effects are real? And uh, I've kind of uh, hinted at uh, the five that are shown here in white are the biggest five effects and are probably the real ones. Um, but we can uh, also put these on a Pareto chart as well as looking at uh, the, the effects. 
uh, on the, their actual uh, uh, benefits on the previous chart. And we can see there's one big spike, the interest rate there, and then the uh, second spike with the sticker, and then we've got uh, the second buck slip, the copy message are, are, are both kind of about the same size, third spike, letter heading next, and then they keep going down there. So which of these are real? There's a number of ways to actually uh, decide how to do that. Uh, you can just use the Pareto principle, look at the Pareto chart and decide, well, where would I cut off uh, this as the most important ones to address? Uh, actually, the authors uh, went ahead and used a two proportions test. Remember that uh, there were 5,000 um, uh, mailings for each of these 20 conditions. So uh, there were 50,000 that were run at the low level of any given factor and 50,000 at the high level. And they did two proportions tests on what, uh, uh, if there was a difference in the proportions. And indeed, those top five factors I highlighted on the previous chart are the uh, 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 five that came out as being uh, significant. Uh, since this is a saturated model, we could also use a lens method for kind of sorting out things. And there's a bunch of stepwise um, analysis and other model selection rules in there that I won't uh, talk about. Many people decide what... Uh, uh, to uh, just on, on actually cutting off, you know, what are the top ones that I really need to uh, look at. So, uh, any event, those five seem to be the uh, most meaningful ones. So, the only other uh, technical question I want to come back to is the second order effects. And here's an interesting thing about the plaque of Berman designs: they uh, uh, they do have some confounding of the main effect with interactions, but it's not as severe or or all encompassing as you would see in a um, two to the K minus P uh, factorial design where it's a power of two, okay? So um, one of the things that uh, makes that nice is if we don't saturate our model, the error term uh, that we use to decide what is and isn't statistically significant um, is, um, uh, includes uh, kind of these broken up small interactions. And so they just kind of increase the noise and it's a good way to uh, still figure out what the important effects are from that noise. And there is a way, and, the, uh, and, and this is uh, shown in the next few charts, teasing out significant interactions among the top Pareto factors. Um, and that uh, gets into these correlations that are between the main effects of uh, the 19 factors. And for each factor, you could have as many as 171 different two-factor interactions affecting that main effect. Uh, the good news is that there's no correlations among the 18 interactions involving that factor, meaning that if I'm looking at factor effect A, it's interaction with B, C, there's no correlation, perfectly uncorrelated. And most of the correlations uh, of, uh, that are around 144 of them actually are really small, just uh, plus or minus 0.2. But there are a few correlations, even in the plaque of Berman 20 run design, that uh, the, a factor effect and the two-factor interaction that has a large 0.6 plus or minus correlation. And those are the ones that uh, the authors kind of note uh, when they go through uh, their analysis and say, hey, look, we have five top factors, but let's look at the top three factors, S, G, and R, that came from, my Pareto, came from the Pareto. And if you look at those top three factors, uh, it's kind of interesting to note that there's a strong correlation between factor R and the SG interaction. That's one of the 0.06 correlations. And in fact, when you run the model um, on top there, you'll see that uh, actually the SG interaction is important, but the R main effect, which was one of the top five spikes, isn't. So really, they're concluding, and, and I think uh, properly so, that uh, most likely what we're seeing is an interaction between S and G rather than the main effect of factor R in this experiment. And that's what the middle says there. And they bring back in at the bottom uh, the fourth and fifth spike, I and J. So their final model, um, if you put on blinders, it might be S, G, R, I, J as the top five factors. But because uh, noting some of the correlation structure here, they felt S, G, I, and J were four important factors. And the S, G interaction was the fifth thing to put in. So, so that's good. Any event, in applying the results, you pick the uh, they pick the right a few factors and you send them to their preferred settings. Uh, or um, um, if you've got the trivial many, the ones that weren't important, either set them to their cost-effective settings. In other words, if something isn't beneficial, don't spend any money doing it. Or you can use the preponderance of evidence settings. Even things not significant, you might 
have hints from uh, the factor effects plot of what might be important. And there's other things you can do about uh, interactions, uh, the fold over, like I mentioned before, or just do a full factorial for the vital few x's. But the authors actually what they did, just to kind of close the loop on this, and that's an important part of all this, that usually these uh, experiments aren't one-shot experiments, and it's a sequence in your learning. They took the top factor uh, and uh, combined it with three new factors and did a full factorial experiment here and got uh, the ultimate uh, results uh, from this follow-up experiment with just four factors, seeing there were four important factors and two uh, important interactions that uh, uh, came out of uh, this particular uh, second experiment. So, so that was uh, the first experiment with the uh, marketing using a plaque of Berman design. Uh, I'm going to move now to uh, example number two, which is uh, the heat sealer experiment. It comes from Wayne Taylor's Optimization and Variation Reduction and Quality book. Uh, he had a heat sealer, which, you know, seals the top of plastic bags con containing either supplies or potato chips. And there's six factors, and there's a current sentence listed on this chart of um, uh, what's there. But we wanted to see, is are those the best settings? Is, is there a, uh, um, uh, something that can give us a better target, but also uh, uh, reduce variation as well? So he actually studied eight factors, factors seven and eight as noted by notes A and B on this chart, were a couple of environmental factors he added. And he varied these eight uh, factors through the two levels that are shown there. And he ran the experiment shown on this next chart. There's the eight uh, factors and their various levels. Now this is a two to the eight minus four experiment, meaning there's eight factors in it, but there's only 16 runs, two to the four. So that's the shorthand two to the eight minus four says it's that fraction of the full two to the eighth experiments we could have run. And then in addition, he ran a center point at the beginning and at the end of uh, the experiment. So that's why you have a total of 18 experiments. And at the end of the day, if you look at the complete analysis of those 18 experimental um, um, runs, you can see, and here's the Pareto again, the most important effect is the AB interaction. And the second most important effect is uh, AA, uh, which is A squared. Uh, but you got to be careful with these uh, two to the k minus p experiments, especially if they're in the, the fractions, uh, because the interactions, unlike the plaque of Berman designs that are not a power of two, these uh, designs that are a power of two, the interactions will land directly on top of uh, main effects or on top of other interactions that are fully confounded. So what I've shown in red on this uh, diagram is that the AB interaction here could possibly also be the CH interaction or the DF interaction or the EG interaction, or perhaps several of them. And the A squared could actually be any one of the eight <clears throat> factors uh, squared terms. So that's what the center point check allows us to do in these designs, comparing the two center points to the average of the 16 factorial points. And then the Pareto goes down there, B, A, C, and D look like to be the most four most important factors. So most important factors I've listed here in red on this chart. Here's the, the more detailed string of how, what interactions are, are confounded with what other interactions. Uh, but we've identified the four most important variables, A, B, C, and D. We want to resolve the uh, curvature and the, the center point check at the bottom of this chart. We also want to resolve that interaction string that was labeled A, B. And we can do that with an augmentation of the original design. So we can actually just add some extra experiments. Um, you could do something as simple as just using what's called axial points for augmentation. I'll, I'll use that later. They did something slightly different. They actually were using e-chip here when they were running uh, this experiment. And they did a, a computer-aided augmentation of this design that led them to this final answer, uh, that A squared is the squared term that's important. Uh, B squared is actually also important there. You can see it down there a little bit. And AB was indeed uh, the interaction of importance, and uh, they uh, uh, were able to uh, get uh, uh, the results they need with this full understanding of these four factors. And for those that love to look at output rather than pictures, <laughs> here's all the output from the full response surface of that uh, four factors and their squared terms and their interaction terms. Uh, the experimental runs can estimate all the ones that are listed but we can drop out the ones in red um, as being unimportant and come up with a smaller model if we want. Okay, that was, uh, that was example number two. I now want to re uh, uh, move from the screening world to the uh, optimization world, if you will. 
okay? Both of the examples I previously showed you started with screening experiments, they actually did some follow-up experiments afterwards. But uh, I remember uh, one of my uh, ex-DuPont and ex-George Box student, uh, uh, Dave Bacon, um, once wrote an article uh, back when on uh, making the most of a one-shot experiment. There may be situations where you just got a, uh, a smallish, maybe not small, but number of factors, and you just got one shot to experiment, and you want to uh, uh, make the most of it. And response surface designs are uh, a very uh, good way to uh, do that. Um, the uh, purpose of this chart I'm showing you right now, which is uh, very busy, and I could spend uh, a whole webinar just on going through all the principles of designed experiments that are on this chart, but let me draw your attention to the degrees of freedom uh, row, because basically if you think about designed experiments, you're trying to, with an efficiently small number of runs, n, you want to estimate the number of parameters in some model you're considering, p. So p is the number of parameters in the, in the model. You don't want to, uh, you know, if you, if you got one x and you're fitting a straight line, you can do that with two data points, but you don't want to just run a two data point experiment. You'd like to have some extra experimentation for lack of fit. So the L in the next uh, circle is the number of additional treatments beyond the minimum uh, to check for lack of fit of your model. And then uh, uh, if you can uh, put it in your budget, a little bit of pure replication. Uh, we saw a hint of that in the second example with the two center point runs, uh, but you might add a little bit more here to come up with a high quality uh, model uh, is, uh, is what's happening. So N equals P plus L plus R is kind of the uh, equation that we'll be looking at. The P for a quadratic uh, polynomial model, I've got uh, models with one, two, and three factors here. The third uh, model here, the, you can see y equals b naught plus three terms involving x's, three more terms involving the interactions between two x's, and three more terms involving the squared terms for the x's. So that there are p equals 10 coefficients that we want to collect data to estimate those so we can get a full quadratic polynomial model describing uh, our situation. And we'll come back to in examples three and four, those questions in red on the bottom. Um, well, Box and Wilson back in 51, Box and 157, all they, they developed these class of designs, uh, response surface designs called central composite designs. They start out with the uh, data points on the cube, the eight corners for three factors, if you will. And then what they add are these axial points, which for this uh, uh, drawing, I have as face centered, meaning they're also at plus or minus one. So there's six of those, and then there's a center uh, point that we typically will do our replication at. So there's 15 distinct conditions shown here in this chart in this uh, central composite design. Those 15 conditions give us five more, L equals five more than the minimum number 10 we need to estimate the quadratic response surface. So that's one class uh, of cataloged uh, response surface designs. The other class uh, is called the box Benkin designs. They were developed in 1960. Don Benkin, uh, uh, whose uh, picture there on the left with George Box on the right, uh, they were in the right-hand corner of a Gordon Research Conference picture, so I snipped that out. It's the only time, unfortunately, I ever did uh, uh, meet Don. Uh, this was well after he had uh, been with DuPont, uh, and uh, his long career was with American Cyanamid. But in any event, they developed in 1960 the box Benkin designs, and for three factors, there are these 12 edges of the uh, cube plus the center point. So there's 13 conditions, which are three more than the minimum. And the whole idea is uh, you don't have to run the three times three times three 27 combination. You can either run this half uh, or the other half uh, to uh, get the uh, response surface you need, and, and that's efficient experimentation. Okay. Now, sometimes you can't run the catalog designs, and the two examples I'll uh, uh, mention in a moment will give you issues where you, it's uh, tough. So uh, what... Uh, you're able to do using the good design principles, but letting the computer try to come up with quote unquote optimal designs. I, I like to call them custom designs. Uh, basically, uh, if you identify your factors and the constraints and other things that are causing issues uh, in using a catalog design, figure the model you want to fit, which gives you P, the number of model parameters, and then you kind of set your desired number of runs how many experiments you want to run. And Bob Wheeler, again, the E-chip uh, inventor and ex-Duponter, uh, his rule of thumb was five plus five uh, is a good uh, 
uh, rule. So the number of experiments is number of parameters plus 10, if you will. Generate your optimal design, review the diagnostics of that design before running it, and you're off and going. When I talk about optimal design, and don't have time to really delve into it, there's a lot of different <clears throat> optimality criteria out there. Um, uh, some people just like to call it alpha, alphabetic optimality. <laughs> Uh, but the two uh, that are most prevalent out there are de-optimal designs, minimizing the variance of the coefficients. That's good for uh, you know an, an estimation, if you will, of effects and uh, what's significant. And there's i-optimal designs that could have maybe uh, preferred uh, for uh, predictive purposes. And these examples uh, uh, both are good, and we'll use de-optimal approach in these uh, two examples coming up. So there's a whole uh, literature out there on uh, that criteria. But uh, software makes it available for you to do it. But when would you need to do it? What do you need to get away from the cataloged um, um, experiments? Well, this example three is one such example. It's uh, something uh, I did with uh, Avelino Lima uh, DuPont application that we wrote up for a, a mini tab case study. We were looking at new stabilizers. We, we were hoping to use them at the lowest amount and we were trying to qualify new vendors. So there were goals and importance of this experiment. And uh, for the experiment, we had five factors. We had uh, a, an amount of reinforcement, an amount of colorant, and an amount of stabilizer. Those are continuous uh, variables, which we coded minus one, zero, and one uh, here. Uh, there were two categorical uh, factors. There were three different vendors we were considering. We'll call them one, two, and three. And there were three different types of stabilizer that uh, we also called one, two, and three. So those are categorical factors. And, um, I've seen people mistakenly say, well, geez, isn't that uh, box banking design, for example, have three levels? Well, why can't I just use that? Well, categorical factors, uh, a little bit different animal in that regard, and you need to kind of uh, consider things uh, um, a little differently. But however, the thing we're not going to do is run three times, three times, three times, three times, three, uh, 243 possible treatment combinations. So what we're going to do is uh, come up with a, 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 a custom design to address this problem. The other nice thing about these last two examples are they actually are a large number of responses we're looking at, okay? There's actually 19 responses in this experiment, and we wanna make sure that they're all uh, uh, behaving well with respect to whatever we decide uh, uh, comes out as a result of uh, our five factors affecting these 19 responses. Now, here's a scary chart. I don't expect you to <laughs> check this out, but uh, if I had C factors that were continuous and D factors that were categorical, uh, and each of those D factors had category, uh, you know, uh, a KI level, so maybe a categorical factor, maybe it was four vendors and uh, six uh, different uh, machines or something like that. Uh, so this is a very generic uh, chart for uh, an experiment with categorical and continuous factors. All it does is says, well, how do I calculate P, the number of parameters I'm gonna to have to estimate? That's at the bottom, and there's that ugly formula. I'm not gonna stay on that chart anymore, but for the specific case of where we had three continuous factors and two categorical factors at three levels each for the uh, example I'm going through, uh, when you add it all up, there are 30 parameters that you have to estimate in the full quadratic response surface. So you've got those 30, and um, I decided to add six rather than five. The rule of thumb is five extra from Bob Wheeler, but 30 plus six gave a nice, you know, 36 and multiplies by, you know, three and six and four and all that good stuff. Um, so I did that, and then I did add five replicates. So the full experiment is 30 plus six plus five, 41 uh, experimental runs. And we looked at 19 responses here, and there's two ways that I uh, uh, show uh, this graphically. There's the, uh, uh, this is not the graphical, this is the tabular version, the stoplight chart, if you will. And um, so on the right-hand side, you can see what's uh, going on with respect to the five factors. The really important factors are in orange um, and, uh, and red. Uh, but uh, by and large, uh, the, um, the different vendors, uh, and there's not very much uh, uh, importance with them uh, being different and uh, stabilizer types, uh, same type of thing uh, as well. All models on the left-hand side of this chart, they're really good. If you look at R-squared adjusteds, all but three of them had really nice R-squared adjusteds. 
Uh, if you look at lack of fit, which we can test because we have both experimental uh, air, pure air from the replicates, and lack of fit uh, there, there's a few that didn't. There's only one model that was a bad fit, but also had a bad lack of fit, and that's YB3. But by and large, good model fits happening after all of these. Uh, that's the uh, tabular chart, but the graphical chart, uh, this is called a response optimizer in uh, Minitab, and that's called a prediction profiler in uh, Jump's version of it. And, and truthfully, Jump uh, was first to the gate. Actually, predecessor of Jump, Brad uh, Jones, was probably the first to uh, actually think of this type of graphical display uh, well before uh, uh, he uh, joined Jump. But it's really a, uh, a really nice uh, way to look at it. It's a dashboard, basically, where each column is each of the factors in your experiment. And I had five columns, five factors. And each row is the uh, is one of the responses. And this thing, actually, I can toggle it all the way down to see all 19 responses. I'm just showing you YA123 and YB123 here. And if you set the uh, conditions in red for the five Xs on the top, you get the predictions in blue on the left-hand side uh, for each of the Ys. And of course, the S and V are categorical variables, and that's why you just see three dots rather than curves. And you can plug and play with this thing. And uh, hang on a second, I'm sorry about that. Um, the uh, uh, so uh, it's very good, uh, a very good uh, graphical display that you can, you can uh, look at to uh, kind of understand things. And long story short, we had uh, from this experiment, we were able to show that uh, um, you know there's there's not much difference among the three stabilizer types. So we can use the the new stabilizer we're considering. Uh, we can reduce the stabilizer amounts to uh, their lowest levels, and there was minimal statistical differences among the three vendors who qualified the new vendor. So there was a, a, a marked uh, uh, importance of this. This was actually a Six Sigma project within DuPont, and it uh, it saved uh, a bunch of uh, dollars. So um, I'll just leave it there and move on to example four, also from DuPont. So in example four, we have a different situation. We have eight components, but it's a mixture experiment we're going to deal with now. Um, our TIO2 business was trying to optimize the efficiency of using it in conjunction with functional extenders, and the application was in agricultural coatings. So we had eight components. They got to add up to 100% because you're mixing them together, and each component had lower and upper bound constraints, and you'll see in the uh, next few charts how that causes uh, uh, challenges in figuring out what a DOE is. But long story short, this is like the one page summary of this uh, case study. We ran 47 experiments because we needed 36 runs to estimate all the uh, uh, the uh, effects in our quadratic model, which is kind of a special form as you'll see in a moment. And then we added five extra for lack of fit and six extra replicates, and that gave us the 47. We uh, had 10 responses, not uh, so this one has 47 runs and 10 responses with eight components, just like the previous one had 41 uh, runs with uh, five uh, Xs and uh, 19 responses. So big experiments, and then we had good fitting models here. So how does mixtures uh, uh, are slightly different uh, and uh, leads to uh, the, the use of the computer to come up with uh, uh, designs? Uh, basically, uh, the first part is if we were to write out our, and I'll just look at two components here, two component quadratic response surfaces there at the top, but that A naught term is multiplied by one, <laughs> and of course one I can rewrite as X1 plus X2 if the two X's are the mixture, and gin and vermouth if you want, for example, <laughs> but uh, if uh, you can just replace one by X1 and X2, you can replace X2 at one squared, by x1 and x1, x2, and you replace x2 squared by x2 and x1, x2. So the top um, equation can actually be rewritten as a very simple three-factor quadratic mixture, b1, x1, plus b2, x2, plus b1, x1, x2, okay? And, uh, but, you know, in regular um, uh, response surfaces where those x's are continuous, we call x1, x2 an interaction, it's best called here a nonlinear blending term uh, because uh, look at this chart. If I were talking about the cost of a blend, that straight line B1 X1 plus B2 X2 would be the right answer. You know, if this uh, if if if, if uh, component one costs B1 gallon uh, dollars a gallon and component two costs B2 uh, dollars a gallon, then the mixture of the two is going to be on that straight line. But the other aspects, the taste, the aesthetics, the 
other properties can have some uh, nonlinear effects associated with it. You're probably blending these two together to find something good somewhere in the middle. And that uh, B12 um, term kind of measures the uh, uh, curvature. <clears throat> now, with the eight factors, uh, we got a lot of terms. Um, and I mentioned stepwise regression here uh, because I'm just jumping ahead a couple charts. Here are the eight components in our 36 term model, okay? Uh, and this chart looks kind of cute, but every line is a possible nonlinear blending term, and there's 20, there's 28 of them plus the eight, the linear terms. So that's our 36 term model that we have to fit here. And notice there's lower and upper bound constraints on these uh, uh, x's. And so with if, with um, with a lower bound and an upper bound, just use a three um, um, component example here. Um, Notice we're drawing these on a ternary diagram. So each of the three corners of this triangle is all x1, all x2, and all x3. And if we put lower bounds only on them, uh, we'll end up with a smaller triangle that's kind of in the middle. But if we also put upper bounds, we come up with kind of a funny experimental region that's shaded there. And of course, that gets even more crazy when we get into eight factors. So that's where you need to uh, use the computer to come up with good candidate experiments and then from those candidates, choose the best ones to run. And that's what we did. And that's what um, we um, uh, fit the um, uh, 10 uh, responses here, the 10 responses. And uh, we fit these uh, models to uh, 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 the data. And, and I did mention stepwise regression. You, uh, if you, it is true that the DOE you generate can estimate all the nonlinear blending terms as well as all the eight uh, linear blending components. The 36 terms of the model can be estimated all from the data, but a lot of them aren't that important. And if you leave all those in, it can kind of really uh, sacrifice your predictability, if you will. So we did use stepwise regression to uh, remove uh, those uh, unimportant nonlinear blending terms to come up with the models that you see summarized here. And you can see uh, all these, uh, all but one of these have, uh, are at least 90% uh, uh, for R squared adjusted. And R squared predicted, which is a, a good first blush at how well you're going to predict, given no extra data to predict from. Um, uh, basically, what R squared predicted does is, uh, hey, let's take our data set, remove one of the data points, fit the model without that data point in, and then see how it predicts the the data point we left out, and we do that for every data point. So it's kind of like uh, R squared adjusted looks at all the data. R squared predicted gives you a little bit more of a comfort feel uh, that uh, your model is going to be good predictability. We're getting good uh, comfort uh, in uh, almost all cases here with respect to how well the model fit. Uh, we didn't just stop here uh, in uh, uh, this uh, study. We actually went out and uh, tried to uh, test with uh, some uh, extra uh, confirmation runs, and they are uh, uh, they, they worked out wonderfully. Here again, just to show you one more time, is the uh, uh, eight components of the eight columns there, and then over here you've got the various uh, responses. I can only fit six of them on the uh, diagram here, uh, but there are ten of them. So you've got your response optimized. You can play around with, and of course. This time, when you change one of these components, the other components have to change too because you got to keep the 100%. But the, that's all built into the software, and it, it works out really, really well. So, so this uh, last case study that I mentioned uh, was a uh, actually published in Coding's uh, Tech uh, back in uh, 2014. Uh, a couple of uh, co-authors and myself, and we've uh, replicated this successfully in many other uh, mixture. Uh, uh, DOEs uh, as well. So uh, the, uh, uh, I'll just leave it at that. So I have um, walked through uh, these charts and left hopefully a small amount of time for questions and comments. But uh, to wrap up, uh, I'll say it's a wonderful life. For those of you who know that movie uh, with George Bailey in it, well, I'm Steve Bailey, but uh, I've, I've been blessed in the sense that uh, I spent my 1970s at the University of Wisconsin, go Badgers. And that's where I, I first met George Box and his colleagues and had many fellow students there that uh, uh, just had a great time there and uh, just a really uh, enlightening uh, start to my career. The next 36 years of which was with the DuPont Applied Statistics Group, uh, more amazing colleagues and all. And I, actually, I still work today for DuPont as a, an external uh, consultant as well. So, 
So hopefully uh, George, who uh, would have turned um, 100 in um, this Friday, uh, he's done pioneering work in so many areas, but especially design analysis experiments. And I, I, I mentioned how that uh, had an impact in DuPont's strategy of experimentation that we've been doing for over 50 years. Hopefully you saw in the two screening DOE examples I, um, I presented that uh, you know uh, two-level fractional factorial experiments are a good first step in uh, uh, the um, uh, strategy experimentation approach. Uh, and I hope you also uh, got an appreciation for the optimization DOE examples that there can be situations that go beyond the catalog designs and they can be handled uh, very nicely by computer generated designs and analyses for uh, optimization. So with that, I'll stop and I guess uh, ask uh, Steve uh, if there's questions, discussion. Okay, well, uh, thank you, uh, Steve. That was uh, quite a good education in experimental design. Uh, I know myself, I was fortunate many years ago to uh, go to the University of Wisconsin for uh, a presentation by uh, Conrad and uh, Dr. Box on experimental design and had the pleasure of being invited to his house. So that was a, a special moment for me. So if you have questions, let's see what I have. Okay. Uh, so uh, here's a question. So Box often recommended normal plots of effects after Cuthbert Daniel to analysis to, to analysis of two level designs, but you didn't mention this method in your list of analysis methods. I just wondered why not. Um, I actually uh, did. Uh, it was kind of hidden. Um, if you think of normal probability plots. Uh, you uh, look at them and you try to see uh, which of uh, the effects are falling outside of uh, you know, what could be normal variation of those effects. And when I mentioned uh, in the first example, I mentioned Lenth, uh, who uh, used, uh, um, he actually uh, starts with normal probability plots, but then says, hey, look, uh, if we take the ones that are in the middle and assume their noise, how can we come up with an algorithm to kind of decide or declare uh, which ones are important. So uh, he kind of uh, uh, put an algorithmic uh, top to uh, a normal probability plots. But I'm very much a big fan of uh, uh, normal uh, probability plots as a graphical uh, tool to kind of figure out what's important. Okay, thank you. Uh, if anybody else has a question, uh, go ahead and send it in the questions box. Uh, of course, this webinar, like all the different webinars provided by the Statistics Division, are available on our YouTube channel. Uh, if you go to youtube.com and search for ASQ Stats Division, uh, you'll find that uh, link and be able to see this webinar, uh, probably posted within the week and the uh, previous ones that we've had on uh, other types of topics. Uh, as I wait for another question, uh, will the slides be available? Yes, I, I can, I'd be glad to uh, share a, uh, uh, a PDF version of every slide. Yep. Okay, so uh, typically what we have been doing is posting these slides in our um, my ASQ location on the statistics division. And for those that are members of ASQ, uh, step one is to join my ASQ. And that opens up uh, a plethora of other communities besides the statistics division. But if you go there, you can download the slides. Uh, we do have another webinar scheduled in early November. It'll be on chi-square testing. It'll be a joint webinar with the Six Sigma Forum. Uh, so we have done two webinars with Six Sigma Forum. We did one uh, earlier this month with Quality Management Division, and we're looking to do one with Lean Enterprise in uh, early 2020. Uh, any other questions? And uh, anyone too shy to ask a question uh, publicly and wants to uh, send me a question, there's my email address. Feel free to use that. 
All right. And not seeing any other questions. Uh, again, uh, thank you, uh, Steve, for the presentation, uh, for reminding us about the contributions of George Fox to our profession. Uh, I won't say go Badgers, but uh, uh, we appreciate all that you've done for uh, the field of statistics and especially for ASQ. I'll, I'll end up with a little uh, um, anecdote. You mentioned uh, even going to uh, George's house when you visited uh, Steve, and uh, he uh, had uh, something called the Beer and Statistics uh, Symposium, he called it. It was at his house on Monday nights. There'd be a case of beer and a uh, researcher with a problem. We'd just sit in his basement and talk about it. And believe it or not, uh, Wisconsin, you even got one credit for that <laughs> if you if you did it over the semester. So that probably was my favorite course. Yes, I uh, I remember his house having a big round area to uh, to be able to uh, have those discussions. So so if uh, no other questions, then uh, we will conclude the webinar uh, now. And again, we look forward for your participation in future webinars, uh, one in November. And of course, in 2020, we'll have another set of webinars uh, available, uh, either posted or advertised on LinkedIn or at our MyASQ. With that, I thank you and uh, concludes the webinar. Thank you, everyone.